All right, let's talk about spelling in the King James Bible. And I got people working outside. There's nothing I can do about that. So the King James Bible was written in around 1611. If you look on Wikipedia, the first authoritative and full-featured English dictionary, the Dictionary of the English Language, was published by Samuel Johnson in 1755. It says here, to a high degree, the dictionary standardized both English spelling and word usage. That means in 1611, the English spelling and word usage was not necessarily standardized. If it's not standardized, it means it could be different things, which means there's not a unique spelling. If there's not a unique spelling, then you um, you can't blame the King James Bible if it doesn't use a unique spelling. So, by the way, if you look 1755, uh, the Blue Letter Bible uses the 1769 edition. So if you think about that for a minute, uh, that's 14 years after 1755. It makes a whole lot of sense that if the language began to become more stable, that an edition of the King James Bible would reflect that, stabi- that level of stability. All right. All right, here's another historical thing under English orthography. Now, orthography just deals with how words are spelled. So it says, um, this is again in Wikipedia, but under rather than um, the English language, this is specifically under orthography. That's spelling, and we're talking about spelling in the King James Bible. By the time dictionaries were introduced in the mid-17th century, right? that's the 1600s, when the English Bible was published, the spelling system of, the, of English had started to stabilize. It began to stabilize in the 1600s when the King James Bible was published. By the 19th century, most words had set spellings. That's the 1800s. Again, eight, uh, 1769, um, you got a standardized version of the King James Bible for spelling, but you still had problems even into the 1800s. So by the 19th century, most words had set spellings, though it took some time before they diffused throughout the English-speaking world. The modern English spelling system with its national variants spread together with the expansion of public education later in the 19th century, which explains why a 1900 edition of the King James Bible would make sense if modern English um, largely began to be set by the end of the 1800s. So we have now two things pointing to why spelling was not said in 1611 or 1769. In fact, this tendency around 1900, if you look, um, this is, I'll I'll link this um, document. U.S. President Theodore Roosevelt also promoted simpler spellings. Initially, he ordered the government printing office to use the Simplified Spelling Board's 300 or so proposed spellings. The order was issued August 27, 1906, while the U.S. Congress was in recess. All right, so Congress voted 142 to 24 that, quote, No money appropriated in this act shall be used for printing documents, Unless the same, unless same shall conform to the orthography, that's spelling, in generally accepted dictionaries. So you see, 
spelling was still becoming established around 1900. And dictionaries were the standard to help establish that. You'll see that the Oxford Historical Dictionary was published in the early 1900s. And what we look at as the final edition of the King James Bible was also established in the early 1900s. Now, there are some scriptures that are used to, to talk about spelling. For example, Matthew 5.18, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Okay, what is that one jot or one tittle? You should know that the word jot only appears once in the entire Bible, and that's in Matthew 5.18. Notice occurs one and one times. Also, that word tittle only appears in two times in the entire Bible. The verse that has the word jot, and then in Luke 16, 17, in a similar verse, where it says it's easier, and it is easier for heaven and earth to pass than one tittle of the law to fail. All right, so what do, what does this refer to, this uh, jot and tittle? All right, well, that word jot, which is a hapex legomenon, that means it occurs only once in the entire text, is the Greek uh, um, 2503, the word iota. Strong's G 2503, iota, iota. Okay, so what does this word iota mean? Uh it says in the outline of biblical usage, the Hebrew letter, which is actually Yad, the smallest of them all, Iota. See here the Hebrew letter Yad, you see the little mark? Um, it's equivalent to the minutest letter in the Hebrew language, the smallest letter in the Hebrew language. Uh, for For, for tittle now, which appears twice. Strong's G, 2762, Keraya. Keraya. Okay, so... Thayer's lexicon, related entry, Keraya. Keraya. All right, so this word is used by grammarians of the accents and diacritical points... Jesus used it of the little lines or projections by which the Hebrew letters, in other respects similar, differ from one another. What do they mean by that? Uh, let's see if I can show you. All right, right here in Thayer's Greek lexicon, if you look down here, the chef and hay, you notice there's just a little space to make these two letters different. Or if you look in Dalit and Resh, notice the Dalit is kind of straight. Resh is just a little curve. That little curve is the difference between the two letters. Bet and Kaf. Notice Bet is squared out and Kaf is just slightly rounded. So that's the tittle. Now, looking more into Iota, that's the ninth letter of the Greek alphabet. And it means basically an extremely small amount. And it's the equivalent to that is the term yod. Notice here it says that yod gave rise to the Greek iota. You know, like when someone says, I don't give one iota, means they don't give the littlest bit. And Yad is just a little mark. And by the way, that verse is, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law 
till all be fulfilled. That looks like it's referring not to all scripture, but to specifically the Torah or the Hebrew law. And in fact, when he says one jot or one twi uh, uh, tittle, it seems to be referring to the Hebrew letters. So specifically Hebrew letters. So, I mean, you might even argue that uh, the law to every letter in Hebrew of the law is what that refers to doesn't seem to be referring to specifically spelling in English in that case, to be honest. That is spelling in the entire Bible, the references to the law there. By the way, even in Hebrew, the letters, if you look at them, they have all the dots and uh, these little lines, those are vowels. Originally, in the Hebrew Bible, they didn't even have those vowel marks underneath. So it's a lot, it's very much like A, E, I, O, and U were not even in the Hebrew until around 500, I think roughly 500 AD. So this is called Nikud, the Hebrew way to indicate vowels. And it says that it developed in the early Middle Ages um, during the, by the Masoretes during the second half of the first millennium. So that's, I'm saying 500 AD. So actually the original Hebrew itself was missing vowel sounds. In fact, they re originally used pictograph scripts and the word with the vowel in most ancient documents was written without the vowel and slightly differently. I'll link this document also. Another verse that's often used is uh, Matthew 4.4, 4. but he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Now, first of all, that word there is word, not uh, directly down to the spelling. And in fact, that word is supposed to be Rima or Rhema. Strong's G, 4487, Rhema, Rhema. Which one of its definitions is a series of words joined together into a sentence. And in Math 26, 34, Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this night before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. If you look in Matthew 26, 75, it says, And Peter remembered the word of Jesus, which said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And he went out and wept bitterly. Well, this word is actually the whole, um, um, essentially, sentence here. Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. Two sentences. Well, the whole sentence. Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. Which is actually words. So this word, word here, is actually used for an entire sentence. The implication being that every word could be every scripture here. And in fact, if we look at that word, that word, word, is that word rima. So um, it is the same English word, word, in Matthew 4.4 4, uh, as in Matthew 26.75. And if we look at the first occurrence of the word word in the English Bible, that happens in Genesis 15, colon 1, 15 verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abraham in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram. Okay, all right. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram. I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. So that word 
is actually a, a statement. Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. It's not a single word but actually a collection of what we call words. So speaking a word to somebody actually is a sentence or scripture or a thought here. So Matthew 4.4, 4, if you look at the first mention of word in the King James Bible, the implication that every word may be every saying here from the mouth of God. Now, 2 Timothy 3.16 says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And scripture uh, implies just what it says, scripture. That's not necessarily spelling there. If you want to see examples of the word scripture, the first mentions in Daniel 10.21. But I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth, and there is none that holdeth with me in these things, but Michael your prince. But an example of that, a good example, is in Mark 12.10. And have ye not read this scripture? The stone which the builders rejected is become the head of the corner. And again, another example of the word scripture, Mark 15.28, And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And again, that jot or tittle, uh, jot occurs once as a hapex legomenon, and tittle occurs twice. And in those cases, it says, uh, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. So if you look, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. In Matthew 24, 35. And it says it again in Mark 13, 31. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words, plural, shall not pass away. Luke 16, 17 is the second place where tittle occurs, and it's without jot. And it is easier for heaven and earth to pass than one tittle of the law to fail. Both cases where tittle occurs, the word law occurs. And in Luke 21, 33, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words, plural, shall not pass away. Now it's interesting, Paul looks like he was talking about the law in 2 Corinthians 3, 6, where he says, Who also hath made us able ministers, of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. But the ministration of death, written and engraven in stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. So notice, engraven in stone seems to refer to the law. And here, Paul seems to make a distinction between the letter and the spirit. Now, if you look in Romans 8.2, For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Again, I think that refers to the contrast between law and spirit. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. And Romans 8.8 8, 
so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. So in conclusion, I don't really see any scripture forcing spelling to be a particular way in English. I do see that spelling was not established in 1611, but it was beginning in the 1600s to become normalized. I do see again in 1755 through a dictionary that standardization was growing, which explains the 1769 edition of the King James Bible. And I do see that as you get to the end of the 1800s, that spelling uh, and the English language itself became more, more established and that it would make sense for a final edition of the King James Bible. I do see that all scripture is given by inspiration of God so that it is important for that scripture not to be changed or, or made different in 2 Timothy 3.16. So you can't just have people writing these modern versions. In fact, a, a last verse to show you. Actually, let me finish with two verses. 1 Corinthians 3.19 For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And 1 Timothy 6.20 O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profanity vain and vain babblings, and oppositions of science falsely so-called. Oh, let me give you one more. Proverbs 24, 21, My son, fear thou the Lord and the King, and meddle not with them that are given to change. Thank you.